Welcome into The Harvest. I'm Andrew Stroud. This podcast is dedicated to helping you be a disciple and make disciples in the everyday places of life. And today's show is going to help you do just that. It's actually a throwback episode to a conversation I had with my friends Abigail and Lakeith a few years back on the topic of formal versus informal disciple making. Should you have a plan? Should you have a program? How do you go about making disciples? What is the best approach? We share from our own experiences how we were discipled and how we've tried different approaches in discipling others. We also look at the life and the model of Jesus. How did he go about making disciples? Did he have a more formal approach or informal approach? What can we learn from him? And then we finish by talking about the strengths and weaknesses of each approach. So I hope you'll check it out and I hope that it can encourage you. On today's show, we are going to be talking about discipleship, but particularly the difference between um, informal and formal, more relational type of discipleship. So we're going to be looking at our experiences and what scripture says about discipleship. So I think it's going to be a really great show. We all have pretty um, long and extended opinions and experiences with discipleship. But I think anyone who's just starting out quickly starts to think, okay, now how do we do this whole discipleship thing? So uh, we tend to to kind of see people go at it either in a very formal and traditional, maybe is a good word, um, way of handling it within a church setting um, and very structured or a very informal sort of relational method. So um, we're going to put people in the box here maybe a little bit by putting those two titles on it, but maybe we can just clarify a little more um, as we go. So just hang with us, Um, but we'll just start by talking about our own experience. So guys, why don't we start with you guys, just share some of your personal experience with discipleship and what that has looked like for you. Yeah, I think for me, uh, uh, discipleship was relatively new to me, something that came about in my 20s. Uh, It's not something that I grew up with or was familiar even with the term a disciple or discipleship. Uh, I knew it exists, but I didn't know that that was something that uh, believers really participated in. It sounded like almost like a foreign concept. So uh, when I first got involved, uh, just with faith in general, there was a young man, uh, Darian Durr, who was on my ship, who took me under his wing and really walked me through the Bible. I think that was my first first exposure to discipleship and uh, that it was all right to have someone walk with you through faith. So um, most of the guys, even for military guys, uh, when they want to get in shape, what they'll do is hire a uh, personal trainer or they're having free at the gym. And um, yeah, it's just someone a little further along than you that can help you get to that next step. And uh, even the big tough guys, they can admit that that was okay. So I think spiritually coming to terms with the fact that we needed uh, someone individually to walk with us uh, through the journey to help us uh, get to that next step was, was good and it was important. And often in Jesus's ministry, you see that happen a lot with discipleship where he was walking his guys and helping them get to the next step and encouraging them to do that after he was gone. So um, I love this topic. I think it's really important, but I, I still think it's a bit underrated. Like it's still under the radar. Yeah, I would, I would, um, I would agree with that. Obviously the three of us are passionate about disciple making. Um, we've committed our lives to it. We've benefited from it, having others invest in us and, teaching us the faith and showing us how to to walk with with God and live it out. Um, but, you know, we're standing here 2,000 years removed from Jesus' great commission to his disciples to, to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And the church over the years has, has embraced that mission to different degrees, and they've gone about it in different ways. And, and some of the way that we see Um, the the church going about making disciples today is more formalized. It's sort of something that's developed over years and centuries um, of, of trying to carry out this mission of Jesus to represent him and to, to pass on to the faith, the faith to the next generation. And then I think each of us has probably also been highly influenced by a more informal approach, a more relational approach where uh, an older believer has taken an interest in us personally 
and begun to to share their life with you. So, it, you know, you mentioned Durr on on the ship, uh, Lakeith. How how did that look? If you could just give like maybe a story that illustrates like how that relationship got started. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the ship uh, every night did a nightly prayer, and I was. <clears throat> pretty ashamed to pray out loud with all the rescue of the rescue swimmers. It was just not something that we did. So when I wanted to pray, I would walk out of the the work center and I would pray with the ship. And uh, one night I was in my bed, um, rack in the Navy. It's a small bed. Oh, it's terrible. (laughs) But uh, the night prayer came on then. It was a little late. So I decided to pray in my bed and someone seen me. I got busted and it was Darian Durr. And uh, he asked me about if I knew what I was praying, if I knew uh, about Jesus, about the Bible. I think at that moment I realized I knew I knew about Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus, you know. And uh, it was it was helpful to have someone to uh, dig a little deeper, to not be afraid to push through and ask me piercing questions that forced me to to come with terms that I didn't know Jesus. So he helped me. I would say uh, after that, get to know who Jesus was. Yeah, I think Keith, that really. Um kind of makes it distinguished very clear to me because that was a personal experience that you had with him. He listened to your, where you were spiritually and then asked mm-hmm. you questions kind of according to what where you were spiritually. Like he started asking you the questions that you needed to start figuring out the answers to. Um, I think growing up in a church um, where I think discipleship looked like um, sitting in church every week, and listening to the pastor and then interpreting that for myself into how that could fit in my life. And then also watching um, my parents and other believers in the church just from afar and kind of mirroring my life after them. But I don't really remember any strong questioning or any kind of clear personal direction of like, Abigail, you should do this because I see you doing this. Or have you thought about doing this? Or are you doing this? Like none of those types of things are happening. It was very much um, discipleship was personal. So um, I was watching other people be disciples of Jesus in their personal life. And I was, it was left up to me to decide if I too wanted to be a personal disciple of Jesus. Um, It wasn't until I was pretty much engaged to Brett and I went to a navigators conference Uh, which the navigators are very much known for discipleship and like personal discipleship. So this is where we kind of get into informal (laughs) versus formal. So before that was definitely formal. And I was super shocked. People I did not know came up to me and asked me, so what are you getting out of your quiet time? And my response was, I don't know you. Like, you? <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know you person. Why are you asking me such a personal question? Um, so it actually took me a minute as someone who is already following Jesus um, to really transition from realizing that being a disciple even could be something that I invited other people into and that I could really learn from someone who is ahead of me in a really personal way that they would interact with me about my faith. And I would answer questions about how I was doing um, really personal questions sometimes. um, And that I could really have a very interactive discipleship relationship. So that was kind of what it looked like. And so seeing both sides, um, not saying one is better than the other, but they definitely teach in different ways. Okay. So, Let's maybe move into our second sort of question for you guys. Um, in as far as Jesus modeling being a disciple of the Father and then him making disciples, what do we see in Scripture that might speak to either this more formal um, picture that we talked about or maybe this more personal, informal version? So what do we see in Scripture? So we have a conviction that Jesus is the ultimate disciple maker. Um, he is, he's the source, but more than that, that, that he's actually our blueprint that I I think the three of us would say that we don't just see Jesus as someone that, that we're admiring from a distance and, and that we, we aren't supposed to follow his example, not just in his character and, and in his devotion to the father, but in the way he went about living and sharing his life the way he went about making disciples, the three of us would say that Jesus is our, our model. 
for making disciples. And so we wanted to really address this question when it comes to formal and informal approaches to disciple making, what do we see from the ministry of Jesus himself? Like what are some examples of Jesus doing, you know, more structured or formal approaches? And so things that come to my mind are, you know, Jesus, he did go to the feasts. Um, he did operate within the, the synagogue uh, structure. He would go from town to town and he would participate in those more formal meetings and more formal uh, feasts. Um, so for sure, that was, that was a sense, there was a sense in which Jesus was taking advantage of the, the, the formal structures that were, were there within his society and his culture to connect with people. But he, he went so much beyond that in terms of, of how he went about making disciples. And um, obviously he, he personally sought out and called individuals, kind of like what you were referencing there, Abigail, um, one of my favorite verses on this is from John chapter one, and it says that Jesus had already met the first few disciples. He had met uh, Andrew and probably John. John isn't mentioned by name, but um, probably John the, and then Peter. Um, and so at least those three had begun to follow Jesus. And it says that the next day Jesus decided or purposed to go into Galilee and he found Philip and he called to him, follow me. And so you see Jesus um, being very intentional to to go to a, a certain location and to seek out a certain person, Philip, but then and, and to give him a very clear call, follow me. Um, but it was in the context of a one-on-one -on -one personal uh, relationship. So that's that's one example that I was thinking of when I was thinking about you know Jesus's formal and uh, informal approaches to discipleship, but there's a ton of them. So <laughs> were there some that stood out to you guys as you were thinking about this? Yeah, I got a call back to, uh, if you guys have been following the podcast for a while, I remember <laughs> in season one when we would try to nail it down to one uh, verse, <laughs> Abigail would always choose more than one verse. So uh, I got to pull an Abby right here. <laughs> I uh, I think of uh, Luke chapter five, when Jesus was teaching um, by the lake, and it says that this huge crowd was gathering around him. And he's teaching all of these people. And you would think that this was it. He's It's kind of formal because uh, the mm. acoustics are great. Like there's a great crowd. They want to hear what he's saying. But he looks over at these two fishermen and uh, they're finishing up for the night. Uh, they're done. They've spent their whole night fishing, haven't caught anything. But he tells them to put out their net for a catch. And what was cool is that uh, despite Peter's maybe frustrations or his uh, hesitant, him being hesitant, he, he still, he, he obeyed. He uh, told Jesus that, hey, at your word, I'll do it, even though it didn't seem like he wanted to. And uh, he did, and obviously he enclosed a large number of fish. And um, what was cool is that Jesus went from his master to his Lord. Like there was a lot of people around that maybe knew Jesus as a great teacher, his master, but Peter obeyed him in that moment, and Jesus became his Lord. And uh, he told him, hey, they left their nets, followed everything. They followed him. Um, but it was cool because he said, from now on, you're going to be— fishing for men or fishing for people. And in that moment, he was fishing for them. I think it's so cool that he modeled this, hey, very informal, like he was teaching. And uh, I don't even think they were paying attention because they're washing their nets, but he chose them as individuals to call, you know, to follow him. And uh, yeah, I think it was really, really neat that even in that very formal setting, he was still aiming for individuals and seeking to impact those guys. Yeah, I think it may be important for us to to clarify by by formal and informal, I don't know if, if some of our listeners might might still be a little fuzzy on, on what we really mean by that. Uh, maybe they're not, but mm -hmm. so if you guys feel like we've we've covered that pretty clearly, then then that's fine. We can just quickly, you know, tell tell me that we're not gonna we're gonna move on from this. Um but but what I think about what when I see what the church is doing today and the the pathway, I guess you could say how we're trying to go about helping people come to faith and then grow to maturity. It's so different from what you see in the scriptures and, and certainly from what you see in Jesus. Uh, and so I'm thinking of the more traditional church that if you, and Keith, you know, you experienced this. I, mm -hmm. I know that, uh, um, and we've seen so many people experience this, that when they really become serious about their faith, there's, there can be an assumption that, well, I need to go to Bible college. I need to go to seminary. And I need to, um, 
become a pastor or become so, some sort of official uh, religious person, which is a very uh, formal approach or formal pathway to to disciple making. And it's, Abigail, it sounded like for you, it was it was similar as it was for me growing up in the Bible Belt, there, that there really wasn't an informal pathway, like an alternative um, apprenticeship approach. And yet I think that's what you see in in Jesus. He seems to operate out of a more more often than not, it's an informal approach to disciple making. I mean, we see in his disciples that he chose fishermen and tax collectors, who's maybe the most educated, but I don't know. I mean, I mean, Matthew could add and subtract, but we don't know if, like, <laughs> what else is going on with him. They all had like the minimum for Jewish boys at the time, which is probably more than our kids today, but that's another story. So, um, but the, but I think the bottom line is that they weren't the super educated and they weren't the ones who had clearly been chosen to be in the, the track to be a rabbi. So it wasn't like they were super smart. Um, I think that can just be encouraging for all of us. Um, as also followers of Jesus, also as disciples of Jesus, that we too can be disciple makers. Um, And so I think as much as maybe we've covered a lot of how to be discipled and the different ways that one can be discipled so far, um, I think we also can just be encouraged that if we're spending time with Jesus ourselves, whatever we gain from Jesus, we can pass on to someone else about Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really kind of cool. But just this week, I had a friend um, ask, um, because she kept being asked by people she was discipling, like, you know, what are the criteria to disciple someone else? Mm-hmm. And my criteria is, all, is always, are you one step ahead of them? Then you can disciple <laughs> <laughs> like, and honestly, if they catch up to you, then you can just do it together and be partners. Mm-hmm. But um, I think a lot of times we do have that mentality that we do have to go off and get a full blown education and in order to disciple others. And that may stem from that formal discipleship that we've seen. So, for instance, in my story earlier, if I had just taken what I had seen the only way for me to impact someone else was for me to, I guess, teach Sunday school because I'm also a girl. So I wasn't going to be preaching um, in that particular church. So I think um, for me, it was I was seeing the only way to impact someone else's life was to be a teacher, for one. And um, it definitely didn't look very personal. Um, and so I was going to need probably more education or just a lot more experience, a lot more knowledge of scripture. They all had like, you know, just infinite years behind them. It felt like that showed so much wisdom. Um, so I think being able to pull back the curtain a little bit um, for us and saying like, we're not that special, like you can do this too, is really important for us to be more like Jesus in this situation. You know, he was... Um, He was Jesus, so we're never going to be that good, but we can, (laughs) we can um, at least mirror the way he was um, impacting the world. Um, My favorite kind of example that I was just reading in Mark this week is just how Jesus would share parables with the masses and then his followers would ask him questions. And so privately he would go deeper with them. So even if we are kind of maybe meshing that, um, that, formal picture with the, the more f- and more inform- formal, <laughs> I just tripped over my words. Um, even if we're doing that, we can kind of use that formal environment to hit, you know, maybe a larger section of people, but we are taking it into an informal setting of just living life with people, um, sharing in their lives. Um, if they invite us into that, then that is really the best way to be discipled. So yeah, I just rambled for a while there. Um, Mm -hmm. Let's, (laughs) any thoughts on that before we move on? I'm sure I said way too much. No, I did have a a few thoughts. One is there are some strengths, I think, to both. There's, there are some strengths to to having a more formal approach. The one that came to my mind was that you can make sure that major topics get covered. Mm-hmm. So, so typically, if you have a, a more structured, formal approach to disciple making, then you're thinking ahead and you're, you're, you're thinking through what are the big pieces. And we have some formal things that we do. We have some, some curriculum that we take young disciples through, and it, it's available on the website at End of the Harvest. So we use the foundation series. That's a very formal approach. So it's not that we're saying that you should either do formal or informal. 
Um, it really does need to be a blend. And I think Jesus had a blend. We operate uh, with a blend. One of the advantages of formal disciple making is that you're, you're thinking ahead and you're trying to make sure that the main pieces are covered. But one of the advantages of informal is that it's more true to life. And so you're actually finding out what the other person is really struggling with because you may be covering a very important, genuine, legitimate topic in your formal program of, of discipleship or in your curriculum. But the, the person you're discipling may be struggling in a totally different area. Hmm. Uh, and the informal approach really allows you to have that kind of interaction and those kind of conversations, like you mentioned, Jesus having with his disciples, Abigail. Yeah, and I think, you know, we that's a great example. Um, and we've talked about this before. Um, you don't even have to be that, you know, with it and together and thinking ahead. Because we do have awesome resources like that foundation study. So you can just print it out yourself and read it with them. We're not even making you think that hard. <laughs> So the good news is that we do have so many generations before us and so much material that we can um, steal, so to speak, from each other in that. Um, so we really don't have to just have it all together ourselves, I guess. Um, Keith, would you say that this um, this approach of formal and informal, how does it look in your own personal ministry? Yeah, I think, I think that's a good question. I think um, maybe... Uh, one of the things I can talk about is just the genesis of it, like ministry in an individual's life, you know, for, uh, the informal folks, like, you know, we do a, a Bible study on Tuesday nights at 32nd street. And most of the individuals we, we bump into are, uh, when they're eating at the galley or they're bowling or, uh, they're just going through everyday life, you know, and, um, that's our mission to try to engage them in a natural way, but also to, to extend the invitation of the good news of the gospel of a community that wants to help them grow in their faith. So it's a very informal approach, I would say, to ministry because uh, we're not online and uh, reaching out and broadcasting this awesome Bible study where people are dropping their emails and they're just swinging by. But we're getting up uh, almost cold turkey and just talking to them about faith and about their background. And uh, some people are, are very open to it and uh, literally have people run away at time. So it's, mm -hmm. you, you never know what you're going to get. So I, I do think that the informal approach can be sometimes uh, more challenging because you don't know what to expect. You know, you never know where a person's at. So the results may vary, but uh, I would say it's very worth it because I was informally invited out to a Bible study. Guy on the beach approached me with a cool hat and uh, I was inquiring about his hat and he was inquiring about my, uh, my everything, you know, but, uh, <laughs> thank God he did because he had the boldness to invite me out to the study. Uh, and it was from there where I really, you know, uh, grew in my faith. So I, uh, I am, I am pro informal. I am pro formal, but right now I think for us, what works, uh, the best right now is an informal approach because there's a lot of people who, uh, wouldn't be engaged otherwise if we weren't willing to get out there and to rub shoulders uh, with them in everyday life. Yeah, we're, we're fans of all. I, you know, I was thinking that there's really maybe when it comes to disciple making and, and the church, I really see three big categories. One is it's just missing. Um, in some of our churches, there's no, there's no intentional approach to disciple making. And it's just built around um, there's a Sunday service. There may or may not be um, faithful teaching of God's word, but then that's it. There's there's nothing beyond that 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 is targeted towards purposely trying to help the people who show up on Sunday to become genuine disciples. It's just it's just a Sunday service. And then I would say the second approach is that we can we can start to develop more formal um, ways of trying to offer more in-depth disciple, disciple and growth opportunities. So whether that's a Bible study or a life group or, um, a disciple, a, a discipleship program. Um, and a lot of churches will have, have begun to do that. The third is the, the more informal relational approach that, that we are all huge fans of and that we see in the life of Jesus, that the primary way that Jesus, I mean, if you think of the people that were impacted by Jesus, the people that were, that were left after he returned. You know, like, where were the 5,000 that he fed after he ascended back into heaven? 
We don't we don't see them. They go. They go. Yeah. So the people who were really changed for life from Jesus's ministry were the ones that he spent the most time with informally, you know, traveling the roads between the cities, answering those questions, Abigail, after the parables, um, <laughs> getting rebuked uh, because they were always blowing it, you know, forgetting to bring bread or, or um, you know, contradicting Jesus in his mission. I mean, those are the stories that we're so familiar with in the Gospels, most of those are, are examples of Jesus' informal ministry, the, the informal interactions that he had, not just with the disciples, but even with other individuals that he happened upon, um, people who needed to be healed. And those interactions that he had that were not programmed into his daily, weekly schedule as a, a formal plan of, of disciple making, but that he just stumbled across in the course of his life and was willing and available to to share with them um don't know where i was going with that but uh <laughs> <laughs> that was good oh man really it good was thought. good it yeah. was great um unfortunately guys we are coming to the end of our time yeah. but i do want to just shift it over to you listening um if you have any questions or thoughts about today's episode we definitely want you to leave us a comment uh, we want to hear maybe as you were listening, have you been more informally or formally um, discipled yourself? What are you doing as you're discipling others? Um, what does that look like for you? We would love to hear about all of it and how that's going. Um, and we definitely will be coming back to this type of topic again. So don't worry. This is an ongoing thing on our show. So thank you again for listening. As always, it was tons of fun. And we hope that you will share this with somebody you know. We'll talk to you later. Bye, guys. Bye, Abby. Yeah.